שלום, חג שבועות שמח. I'm so happy and excited to be with you and to learn a little bit. And I want to focus on the tenth commandment, thou shall not covet. The tenth and final commandment is the most fascinating of all ten commandments. Similar to the first one, it doesn't concern itself with the practical, but with conscious. In my opinion, the Tenth Commandment is also the deepest and the most spiritual of all the Ten Commandments. It strives not only to form a religious society, but also religious personalities, an internalized religion. It doesn't settle for restraining from wrong action, thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, so on. It demands working on one's characteristics. Thou shall not covet your neighbor's house, thou shall not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that belong to your neighbor. It seems that this commandment is also the most demanding of all Ten Commandments. Can a person really control their desire to want something that belongs to someone else? You can command someone to not do something, but can a person be commanded to not want something? And to not want at all? We all know that Rabbi Elazar Kapar was correct when he taught us in Pirkei Avot, in the Mishnah, the sayings of the fathers, that jealousy, lust, and the honor, pursuit of honor, remove a person from the world. Nevertheless, who among us doesn't become jealous sometimes? Who among us doesn't desire for more? How many times do we face this feeling and thoughts of why do they have and not me? Why does she have this or he has this property and not I? Yet, the Torah says, mm, the Torah commands, the Torah forbids coveting. So how should we understand this prohibition? How can we strive to this level? I will offer three strategies for dealing with thou shall not covet. The first understands the Torah not only as prohibiting another's property, but also as prohibiting attachment to property in general. According to that, the prohibition to covet is a categorical imperative. In order to refrain from it, one must develop a co contempt towards property. This understanding is rare in, in the Jewish world, but nevertheless, there are several key figures who represent it. Take, for example, the Hasidic master Rabbi Meir of Permishlan, Rabbi Meir. He was righteous, humble, and very poor. At the end of each day, he used to distribute his property to the needy. As the great Hebrew poet Uri Tzvi Greenberg put it so nicely, let not a copper penny distinguish him from his God. I repeat, let not a copper penny distinguish him from his God. A slightly milder fact may be exemplified by the famous story concerning Rabbi Israel Meir Cohen of Radin, one of the great Jewish sages of the 20th century, who authored the Mishnah Ra and the Chafetz Chaim, which is how he is better known. It is told about the Chafetz Chaim, and it is not important if the story is completely accurate, that the Chafetz Chaim was satisfied with an apartment under the stairs of his yeshiva. On one rainy day, a rich Jew came to visit him from afar, specifically because he heard about his greatness. He entered the Chafetz Chaim's room and saw that the place was so small and tiny and lacking that he didn't even have a place to hang his wet coat. 
he wondered and asked the rabbi, a rabbi as important, as great as you, how is it that you don't even have a coat hook here? The Chafetz Chaim answered him, why are you asking me? You also don't have a coat hook here. The rich person said to him, are you making fun of me? I am a guest here. To which the Chafetz Chaim retorted, I am also a guest here in this world. This view, which supposes that we are guests in this world, and therefore it is forbidden that we become attached to property, is indeed an extreme and exceptional position within Jewish tradition. Another strategy is to understand the commandment as the Torah creating a distinction between me and my fellow brother. It is creating a private space. The commandment represents the fundamental right for private property. It is not for forbidden to covet. It is forbidden to covet my neighbor's property. As stated in the sages of the fathers in the Mishnah, the principle is what is mine is mine and what is yours is yours. This is a principle that our entire society is founded upon, isn't it? But it is interesting to see that in Pirkei Avot, in the Mishnah, there are two different approaches, two different judgments concerning this view. The first, which is the more positive one, states that this is just a middle path. The Mishnah is not excited by this stance. In contrast to the Hasid, the altruistic person who says what is yours is yours and what is mine is also yours. The second opinion is even harsher and states that this position of what is mine is mine, what is yours is yours, is considered as midat sdom, as characteristic of sodomy depicted by the Bible and the Midrashim as the most evil society. Now, a person who internalizes that the right for individual property for themselves and for their neighbors may be able to overcome his coveting desire. But I believe that Pirkei Avot is correct in their assessment. Often, it is precisely the recognition of others' right to property that increases competitiveness, desire, and the feeling of coveting another's belongings. We may know that it is prohibited to take another's property through illegal means, but this doesn't mean that we cannot covet their property. You know that not only does Western economics not see a prohibition on coveting another's property, it sees it as a virtue, unfortunately, as a virtue which should be praised. There is a third strategy through which I like to understand this commandment and I think that it will teach us a lot about the nature and the importance of the covenant made with the people of Israel at Sinai, and not just this specific commandment. According to this view, the Torah leads us to develop a spiritual disposition of expanding the self. The internal work that allows us to overcome our covetousness is not necessarily by emphasizing the boundaries between myself and others. Quite to the contrary. Sometimes it depends on my ability to see the others as closer to me. There is a very accurate statement found in the Talmud which I identified with. 
A person is jealous of everyone except for their child and student. With these relations, there is a closeness that prevents us from feeling of jealousy and covetousness. According to this approach, standing at Mount Sinai transformed the people of Israel from a group of individuals into a community. In Hebrew, there is a lovely word that we often use called Firgun, which comes from the Yiddish, Farginen. This word is difficult to translate into English, but generally it means to look at what someone else is doing in a positive manner, in an open heart, lev patuach, to truly be happy for them and not to want it for yourself. In a community, like in a family, one is able to take this perspective, this firgun, the success of one is the success of all. Each successful person, each successful couple, each successful family strengthen the entire community. I would like to believe that the prohibition of those shall not cover summarized the entire Ten Commandments which created a community and nation from former Egyptian slaves. I would like to believe that it teaches us Lefargen, to truly support one another and strengthen one another, to look at one another in a positive light, to be happy that they have a home, that they have a spouse, that they have belongings. Like parents, like parents who love to watch their children succeed and make it in life. We are not jealous at our children. We celebrate their success. Now, you have a community like this, a loving, encouraging community that invites guests and warmly receives them. I cherish personally the visiting and the, the hospitality that I experience in your community. I hope that together with you on this Shavuot, we will succeed in passing this internal process which we no longer see our fellows as potential competitors, but as family, as one community, as community members and part of one people. I miss you and I am worried for you. I want to wish you a very happy Chag Matan Torah, very happy Shavuot, a holiday in which we desire to not desire, but rather to live again, and hopefully to meet you soon in your place or here in Jerusalem. Leshana Ba'a. בירושלים הבנויה, בבריאות שלמה, חג שמח.